When did you first become aware that Wendell had this visitor, Connor Orion, Derek Hennessy, staying at his place? Wendell called me while he was at his place and asked me if he could stay at my place and that uh, Jem Cox would bring him up. And that was a few hours before they arrived. And what was Wendell's reasoning for wanting him to be up there at your place? He didn't say I didn't ask. You have an extremely close relationship with Wendell then, I presume. Well, I've known him since the 70s, and we've worked on many cases together and traveled many, many places. So it was uh, a normal thing for him to ask me and me to say okay without needing to know any more details. Uh, Wendell's grandson, Jem Cox, came to uh, visit me after Wendell had called and had a uh, guest with them. Wendell had asked me if Jem and a guest could come and stay at my place in uh, Paradise Valley, Arizona, and I said that would be fine. So Wendell and uh, this guy came, uh, kind of a tall, rugged-looking guy with a scar across his face, lots of tattoos, kill motherfucker, you know, etc. on his arms. And uh, had uh, military fatigues on in a duffel bag and uh, was quiet but pleasant. And Jem had his own guest house that he could stay in. And I let um, uh, John stay in the other guest house. And uh, over Who's John? Well, that was how he was introduced to me was as John Connor. Oh, it wasn't even as Connor or Ryan. It was as John Connor. John Connor. I never knew the other name that you just said. Okay. Okay. Uh, it was uh, John Connor, and no explanation was given to me about who he was or anything. It was not necessary, so I had a little guest house, another one that he could stay in. That was fine. As the uh, days went on, Jim Cox let me know that this was someone who uh, needed safe harbor as he was deciding about whether to go permanently AWOL from his job up at Area 51, or whether he would go back. So to me, it was, uh, yeah, bullshit. You know, this guy is uh, somebody uh, just wanting a place to stay or whatever his game is. It just didn't compute that a guy who was uh, AWOL from Area 51 uh, would be uh, here staying at my uh, ranch in uh, Paradise Valley, but so be it. Odder things had happened. What allowed you to let him, a complete stranger, stay there? Well, first of all, Wendell had asked me to do it, and second of all, Jem Cox was there. And uh, Jem Cox is no wimp. And he stayed completely invisible. I mean, we never saw him in the daytime, and he really didn't come over to the main house. And we'd see him walking around, and Jem and him were the two people communicating with each other. So even though the atmosphere was that of, of, of a violent drama, violent claims, it wasn't going on in a moment to moment. It wasn't obvious. Only occasionally when people would come over that I was working with, would they see him in the day or night and ask, you know, who's that scar-faced guy with all the tattoos on walking around with some kind of legending weapon? And... Um, I don't remember what I might have said, but uh, it would have been to try to dismiss it. What did you think was going on while you were doing your other projects with your business and, uh, uh, you know, managing your own personal life and, uh, uh, you know, daily events? What did you, what sense did you get was going on with Jim and Connor during that time as to what they were doing, you know, day to day? Well, I don't think Jim was doing things on an hourly basis with Connor because he was working on our project, which was developing software for a supercomputer center, which eventually, the following year, we did do and did open and did get going. And that's where I had various people from audio and video to computers to image processing coming and I had little little labettes all over the property and Jim was part of that 
so his main reason for being at the ranch was because he was working on that project, not because he was there uh, as the concierge for Derek Hennessy. So this was just a place for uh, Hennessy to cool while Jim worked with you on his project. Yeah. Wendell thought it was safer up there on your ranch than here at Wendell's place. I assume so. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, also staying at the ranch was another friend of, of Jim's who was um, uh, a, a woman who had spoken at the uh, first UFO Congress in Tucson uh, about being a walk-in. Her name was Sheila. She had another name, uh, Omnek Onyek. So it was a real contrast. You know, we're working on supercomputers and recording stuff in my other labs are on the property, and I got a guy with a scar and a woman from Venus also staying at the property at the same time. It was very colorful. He would stay in his um, cabin during the day and would uh, literally patrol the property at night. I mean, he was a night walker and would walk around. And Jim let me know that he was concerned that people were uh, tracking him and that they would find him. And the story unfolded in, I guess, a period of a few days that he had been a uh, security guard at uh, Area 51, specifically one of the uh, labs there. Um, uh, S4, Area 51, all of that was just unfolding at the time. Uh, Bob Lazar and the, the discussions about all that were fresh. So for me, it was none of my business. They didn't report to me on a moment to moment what they were doing. And I don't think that if that was genuinely what was going on in his world and he was continually on the lookout for people finding him, as could have been what those ninja footprints were later, that he would have told me what they were doing if they were going to go do something covert because that wouldn't that wouldn't make sense for people to know where he was and what he was doing if there were people going to be following him or coming and doing something to us to find out where he was. So at least there's a little continuity there. But uh, they, didn't, they didn't tell me what they were doing. They're doing what they need to do. I'm doing what I need to do of being a good host. But it started unfolding that he supposedly had been a... Uh, security guard uh, at the end of his career, which had included uh, being um, an assassin of enemies of the United States, people that were whistleblowers or were dangerous, and he had photographs, which he did show me a couple of. He did. Of uh, Polaroids of dead guys, showed me photographs of alien in a tank, a UFO, uh, uh, things that could have been out of a science fiction movie or they could have been what he said. It was just, that's what he was showing me. And what were the conditions that... Go ahead. Well, I just, it just it seemed uh, odd that if someone really had been in these positions of authority and uh, extreme uh, activity, would find it necessary to convince me that he had done these things. But so be it. Maybe I seemed like someone that credibility needed to be acquired with, so I, I listened and we we'd talk occasionally five or ten minutes at a time. Now can you describe uh, picture by picture, do you see any of those pictures in your mind still that uh, Connor Orion showed you, uh, John Connor at that time yeah. to you? Uh, do you see them in your mind at all? And can you describe the nature of them? Well, two of the pictures were uh, Polaroids, and it was of uh, someone dead on the ground. Uh, two different people. Um, you know, I can't describe the person. Uh, it's not something I lingered on. It was obvious that the person had been, the, each of them was, was dead, and that there was blood. Uh, in and around the face area, no obvious uh, gun, uh, bullet entry wound that I can recall, but, you know, here are these pictures of dead people. And what was he saying to you as he was showing these to you? 
two different things had been said. One was that his job had been to go on assignment and to um, take out people that were enemies of the United States, that he had assignments, and that he had to take pictures as part of that. I don't recall that being said while he was showing me the pictures. I assumed that these were pictures related to that because he said that he had many of those pictures as part of his insurance that he was not going to be killed and that he had other pictures and had put them in containers in various places including one or two places on my property where he had dug holes and put these coffee cans with, with pictures in them. I didn't know where they were. Have you ever combed your property to find them? Yeah, I did, sort of. I mean, I didn't. I just looked for where. I mean, it was it was 90 acres, so it it, it could have been anywhere. No, I didn't find any, and I didn't comb the property inch by inch looking. I assumed metal detector or anything like no, that. No, no, because I, I, you know, when they left, it was plenty of time for him to have gone and gotten them and retrieved them or. Maybe he did leave them. I didn't uh, assume that he had left them on my property, which is now a big development, so the bulldozers would have found him if they were left there. In regard to the other pictures, um, you mentioned alien bodies. Uh, describe all the yeah. other pictures to me one by one as you recall them, and what Connor may have said to you about them as he showed them to you. And was Jem in front of you when he was showing these, or did you, were you one-on-one -on -one with... Uh, Connor at that time. I don't remember if Jim was there or not. And the photographs were odd looking. Like, uh, I'm thinking these are photographs taken of uh, video in still frame on a screen and someone shooting the photograph because one of the photographs uh, I remember uh, was uh, was a bunch of guys and he was saying it look here's uh, here's Cheney here's this guy here's that guy uh, Bobby Inman and here they all are up on the rail in the lab looking down at the body well that picture could have been taken at the State Department there was no evidence to me that that rail that they were all standing on and they were looking at something was was there. Uh, another photograph looked like a science fiction movie, a, a, a round cylinder, maybe four feet in diameter with what looked like a floating fetus in it. And uh, another photograph of a... Um, looked like a... Looked like a... Uh, extra uh, look like a funny looking person uh, couldn't make out enough detail to respond oh yes this is an alien in a in a work suit working in the lab underground and I saw these pictures maybe a, a week two weeks into his visit and, and how, lo it. how long did you get to study the pictures? How long did he keep them in front yeah. of you? I don't recall. A minute. Each? And they were kind of all spread out. I mean, he had, he had a lot of them. A minute each or a minute total? A minute total. You know, I was trying not to respond like a kid in a candy store. And I wasn't convinced that what I was looking at was what it was reported to be. And I don't remember exactly what I might have felt. I just didn't, uh, didn't take it at face value, what the guy was saying. In retrospect now, how do you feel about this case, those events um, during the you know, October, November of 1991? Well, there's a higher sense of probability of what was said around the whole situation being closer to what was said than I might have thought back then. But by his behavior, 
many of the things that he did were inconsistent with someone that would have had those kind of skills and that kind of training unless he had lost control over his functions. You know, and there was lots of talk about he had to hear a, a phone call with a particular tone on it every three days to reactivate the subconscious programming that he had gotten or he would forget these things or he would behave different than he was right now and he was going to spill the beans and he was going to go to a conference in Los Angeles and I think it was Sean David Morton that we were going to meet or he was going to meet and he had said we didn't see him the night before and he said he was going to go to the airport and some I forget if we gave him the money for a ticket or what and they were waiting for him at the airport and he never showed and there was a lot of phone calls back and forth and it wasn't my job to be his manager to get him there I, I somehow recall knowing about it or being in a couple phone calls or two uh, how many days did he spend with you in total, Jim and John Connor? Yeah, Connor. At least a month. A month. At least a month. So uh, it was entertaining. I had other things that I was doing. I shouldn't say entertaining. I mean, it was it was just what was going on. You, you didn't know? put a lot of credence in what he was showing you and what he was saying. No. I didn't. Not at the time. Not at the time. But two events happened that changed my mind about the seriousness of the situation. He never left the property except one, one night. It was Thanksgiving night. My brother was having Thanksgiving dinner at his restaurant, so we did talk him into coming with us. We all got in the vehicle. I had an inner gate and an outer gate. So we all got in my vehicle in the inner gate. And we left and I closed the gate, locked it, everyone in the car, then went down the driveway, outer gate, open, closed, locked that. Came back a few hours later, it was dark, opened the outer gate, went in, got to the inner gate. And there was a note, a bag, a little sandwich bag up on the gate. And it was dark, so I just took it down and said, well, somebody left a note. Must be somebody that knows me to get to the inner gate. So I threw it on the front seat of the car, opened the other gate, drove in, locked it, went in the house. Everyone went to their guest houses. Susan Gordon uh, was in the house with me. I heard a uh, loud scream from the kitchen, went in the kitchen. As Susan was showing me the bag, which had a chopped off bloody finger in the bag and a note that we could read inside the bag that said time to come home grasshopper or TWEP which I came to know stands for terminate with extreme prejudice it seemed like this wasn't a note for me so I went to Jim Jim went to John also now we knew him as Derek Hennessy and it was decided that it was time for Derek to go. Derek uh, started making phone calls, made arrangements that the vehicle that he could have come pick him up would only be temporary and that I know someone else that could loan a vehicle or buy a vehicle. Or I made arrangements, they left in the one vehicle, met the other people, left in a vehicle that was a white van belonged to uh, a friend of mine who was going to loan it to them, quote, for a few weeks. What happened to the finger? The finger was taken by Jim Cox and uh, Derek Hennessy, and I never saw it again. Then uh, phone calls were happening. Uh, Derek and Jim had split up. Derek was calling me, telling me where he had left the can of film in a movie theater in Florida that I was supposed to tell Jim where to go what movie theater in what seat in what row and with a knife to cut the seat open and to take the get the film well after cutting up a few seats in that theater and there was nothing Jim left and that was the last I heard from them I, I, I actually heard from Jim some months later when he was back about a week after uh, 
that last phone call from Florida, uh, the lights all came on outside. We had motion detectors. And light, the lights all came on. And uh, they went off. Then they came back on. And one of the lights was, was on. It had never come on before. Was was on. was bright enough that it, it woke me up. And as I looked out through the window, I saw somebody running and uh, got a little bit concerned about that. Uh, uh, turned off the power inside for the outside motion lights and uh, was looking out through various windows to see if motion had called the police, called Paradise Valley Police. And I saw someone go around the side of the house, five feet away from me, that had on what looked like a ninja outfit. All black, hood, mask. And uh, started then powering. Power on, power off. Uh, overriding the motion detector, turning the outside lights on, off, on, off. So the police come. And uh, because of the dew and uh, my little sprinklers on the grass, whatever it was, whoever had run across the uh, yard, their footprints had made wet footprints now across the sidewalk and across the driveway. And they look like uh, a one-toed sock, like... Uh, like uh, martial arts footgear, which for me matched with what I had seen with what the guy had on. And I was a bit uh, concerned about it now, piecing it all together, that people were looking for Derek Hennessy, and we had a chopped off finger in a bag on the gate. And uh, it was all, um, it was all uh, very uh, violent in the attitude that was all around it. I did these things. I'm a killer. I worked in uh, this government military base. They're trying to kill me. They're looking for me. I gotta go. There's people coming now. It's, that's a violent attitude. It's not a lackadaisical attitude, particularly when there's people combing my property and there's a chopped off finger in a bag. And uh, that's... Uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it.